Hi, I'm Tim. Join me in this video as we go through practical aerodynamics for model airplanes. These are very easy to use, rules of thumb, practical information that will help make you a better and safer RC model airplane pilot. Let's get to it. Whenever we talk about uh, aerodynamics for model airplanes or anything, the subject can get complicated very quickly. There's any number of books, calculations, it just can get very uh, thorough and in detail on what are pretty important issues for any pilot, full scale or model airplane. In this video, I want to go through a range of aerodynamic considerations, airfoils, dihedral, uh, right and down thrust, uh, torque, talk about it and how you can practically understand them and use them to be a better model airplane pilot on yourself. These uh, tips and tricks on aerodynamic are good for any model you fly. It could be an almost ready to fly model. It could be a kit built model built from plans, your own design or even modifications to an existing design. By having these little bits of knowledge, you can um, anticipate any problems and what it will do will at some point prevent you from crashing your model airplane. So let's go into a little bit more detail of these subject areas. So before we get into the aerodynamics, let's just go over the control surfaces of a model using the Pronto right here. This is a four channel model. We have the elevator in back, up and down, and what the elevator does causes the nose to pitch up or down. Rudder is used for the turn or to help coordinate the turns. That'll help yaw the nose left to right. And ailerons on the wing just go like this to cause the airplane to bank one side or another. And of course, we have the throttle that goes on the front. Let's talk a little bit about flaps in detail. Flaps are at the trailing edge of a wing. They can be in a range of configuration, configuration split flaps, uh, straight flaps, follow flaps, and so forth. Flaps do two things for the pilot. <clears throat> they increase drag and they increase lift. So flaps can be a small amount, say 10 degrees. It can be a lot for 40 degrees. Flaps are absolutely required for high performance aircraft. Jet airliners cannot take off and land without the use of flaps. For a light personal aircraft, they're not as critical. Same for our RC models. For most sport flyer models, you don't need flaps. You can certainly have them. They're fun to use and experiment with. For higher performance models, such as turbine jets or a heavy fast flying airplane, you absolutely need flaps to slow down to get slow enough to land. As I mentioned, flaps um, add lift and increase drag. The first 10 degrees of flaps that you put out uh, add a lot of lift and not so much drag. It is very common for high performance aircraft to take off with say 10 or 15 degrees of flaps. The small amount of drag at the lower airspeeds doesn't matter, but there's a huge increase of lift. When you land, you use full flaps, say 40 degrees. Keep in mind that there's a lot of drag You'll have to carry a little bit more power, and if you are landing with full flaps, realize when you go around <coughs> that drag from the flaps really kick in. You'll have to practice the go-arounds to make sure you track the flaps, perhaps 10 degrees initially to 30 degrees of flaps on the go-around, then slowly get rid of the flaps as you climb out with your model airplane. Let's talk briefly about wing incidents. This is my model of the Mini Lazy Bee. By the way, all the models that you see in this video will be um, listed in the description. You can go to a specialized video on this. And um, also there's chapters at the bottom if you want to jump ahead. What an incidence is of the wing is you'll see the top of the fuselage is a straight line along here. The wing is mounted so it's slightly increased an angle to the top of the fuselage. If it's two to three degrees positive, we call that positive incidence. Virtually all airplanes are built with some amount of positive incidence, even full scale aircraft. For sport flying aircraft, about two to three degrees positive incidence is about right. Times of that is not needed. A very high performance aerobatic airplane, you'll have zero incidence. But by and large, two to three degrees of positive incidence is necessary for a good flying sport aircraft. Most sport model airplanes have a small amount, two to three degrees of right thrust and down thrust built in. So let's talk about those two separately. The right thrust is built in because 
Propeller-driven aircraft with a prop rotating clockwise is viewed from the cockpit, which is the way most of the motors are set up. There are a range of factors that can cause the airplane to turn left. It can be torque, P-factor, slipstream, and precession. It doesn't matter to understand these in great detail, but these combined will tend to pull the aircraft slightly to the left as you're flying along. When you're flying full-scale aircraft, say a Cessna 172, at full power on takeoff, there's enough of that left turning tendency. You actually have to add some right rudder during the takeoff to keep the airplane going straight down the runway. As you um, build up speed, it becomes less and less. You take out the right rudder, but it's there. And what happens is the right rudder, or the right thrust that you put in is enough for to keep the model flying straight at the uh, air speeds you normally fly at, which is normally um, cruising airspeed. But if you're building your own plane, own plane, making it from plans, a slight amount, two to three degrees of right thrust is an appropriate thing to do. Same token with the down thrust, just the way the plane is set up with its positive incidence, at full power it can tend to climb a little bit more than you might want. By adding some down thrust, it'll keep it level at normal power settings for crews. You can adjust it with trim, we trim for airspeed, we'll get for that in a minute, but as a good rule of thumb, for motor installation, a little bit of right and down thrust will be good for a sport flying RC model airplane. Let's talk a little bit now about wings and the theory of lift. Um, for years, the theory of lift was Bernoulli, and Bernoulli was a Swiss mathematician of the 18th century. He was actually dealing with water, but air is a fluid, so it could be similar. But he had a theory of lift that led to um, the discussion of an airfoil that we normally have today on our wings and his theory was when the air flows faster over the top of the wing due to the shape of the airfoil it created a low pressure area that caused the airplane then to climb up and i've been flying for 50 years this was just kind of what we recited again i have a very detailed video on what how wings create lift but essentially the problem with the Bernoulli theory of the low pressure on the top of the wing, it makes sense in the discussion, but what it doesn't explain is how does an aircraft, that same wing, produce lift when you're flying upside down? The answer to that is uh, Newton's third law of physics or um, deflection lift. Uh, any object that uh, has a force will um, act in the opposite direction to that force. So much like when you're in a car, you put your hand out the window, the wind hits the bottom of your hand and it goes up, there are airplane there there is a, a section of the theory of lift that lift it does come from that deflection theory to uh, the wing it's probably a little bit of a combination of both but there the the um, actual understanding of what creates lift is a surprising elusive concept even to very experienced airplane designers but that being said Aircraft designers can very easily show in wind tunnel tests and flight tests the benefits for airfoils. There are a wide range of airfoils or shape of the wing uh, that you can use. It could be a symmetrical airfoil, it could be a semi-symmetrical, it could be a flat bottom airfoil, it could even be a flat wing for some of our RC model airplanes. For aerobatic aircraft, a symmetrical airfoil is probably the best. Part of the issue with a symmetrical airfoil is a little bit harder to build because it's curved on the bottom, you need some sort of jig. A flat bottom airfoil is very acceptable for, for sport flying aircraft. It may not be quite as efficient as a curved bottom, but with a flat bottom on the airfoil, it's very easy to build. We get away with a lot with our model airplanes because they're fairly lightweight, they have plenty of power, so we can even fly model aircraft with completely flat wings. Many of our um, ready to fly micro models have essentially no airfoil, they're just flat bottoms and they fly quite well. A very good example of flying with a completely flat wing is this square flyer that I designed and built. This is 20 inches square, uses elevons in the back. Again, a link to this uh, full build is in the description. And this airplane flies pretty good with a completely flat airfoil. It's a pretty high angle of attack. And what I will say is because you have a flat air airfoil, it's fairly unpredictable with things like stalls and turning. When you have an airfoil shape, you'll have a much better flying aircraft but you can fly with a flat airfoil as I demonstrate here. Another part of having the proper airfoil in addition to performance, range, how much, uh, how high it can fly, what type of load it can take, 
Airplanes are much more predictable when you have the right airfoil on it in terms of handling, uh, turns, and stall behavior. So again, we get, a lot, we get away with a lot with our model airplanes. You could experiment, and that's part of the fun of modeling. Let's talk a little bit about angle of attack and the related to an aerodynamic stall of an aircraft. Whenever an airplane flies, there is an angle of attack of that airplane. The angle of attack is the definition of the angle between the cord line. It's just a line drawn uh, across the cord of the wing and the relative air that's, that the airplane is flying through. So if we're flying fairly slow, the relative wind is like this. This angle between the cord and the relative wind is what we call the angle of attack. Many high performance aircraft, um, airliners, they have an angle of attack indicator in the airplane. It's an absolutely crucial indication. And what the angle of attack indicate, indicator tells you is essentially how hard the wing is working. Because if you increase the angle of attack, let's say you're flying at 80 knots for this airplane, if it was full scale, and you slowly raise the nose, the angle of attack is increasing. At some point, depending on the weight and the speed of the aircraft, as the air flows over the top of the wing, it will start to um, separate from the top of the wing. It just can't continue its flow down and it will uh, separate from the airflow over the wing until it reaches a critical point called the critical angle of attack and the plane will just stall. When the plane does stall, the wing quits flying. It could be one wing or the other wing. It can no longer provide the lift to fly. To recover from a stall, it is absolutely imperative that you uh, decrease the angle of attack. We do that typically by lowering the nose and adding some power. As the um, angle of attack is reduced and the air flow, uh, flows over the wing, you'll again uh, regain lift and you recover from that. So angle of attack is an important concept for flying. Realize when you get slow, you could eventually stall out. There's nothing dangerous or wrong about stalls. In full-scale aviation, we practice stalls all the time to make sure that we can uh, recognize them and anticipate them. And you can do the same with your model aircraft. It's okay to get a little bit of altitude over the field, slow down with the throttle, raise your nose, and just see how the airplane behaves with a stall, lower the nose and you can fly out of that stall. Uh, this is important for landing practice, and if you get too slow, other things that need to keep in mind from the practical aerodynamics, when you bank the aircraft, your stall speed increases. When you are heavy, the stall speed increases. Flaps will lower your stall speed. That's why when you're turning base to final um, for landing, you're typically slow, you're banked. There's a very e uh, good chance that you could stall and spin in. You will not have time to recover. And if you look at YouTube videos of RC airplane crashes, you'll see this all the time. People get slow. The one wing will uh, stall, it drops off, it spins in, and you just don't have the altitude to recover from that. For RC model pilots, because we fly our uh, models from the ground, we may not have a full sense of the airspeed in the model. You're just going to have to get experience flying your model to make sure it has enough airspeed. Remember the difference between airspeed and ground speed. If there is a 10 knot wind going down the runway and you're flying down the runway, even though the model might appear that it's going fairly fast, you have to understand what its airspeed is because it has a tailwind pushing it along. By the same token, if you were to have a 20 knot wind down the runway, a model flying into that wind at 20 miles an hour airspeed, which could happen with the model, the model will literally hover in that, air, in that wind over the ground. Ground speed is zero, but the airspeed is 20 knots. So we have to just keep that in mind, especially when you're flying the downwind leg, the wind's behind you, your ground speed is a little bit higher. Be careful of slowing down, keep your airspeed up so you don't stall in your turn coming into final. Probably the most critical aerodynamic concept to understand, and this applies to any model you fly, almost ready to fly to your own design, is the center of gravity. All aircraft have a center of gravity. That is a point where they balance. If you could magically put it on your finger, it would balance at the center of gravity. It could be a 747 or it could be one of our RC model airplanes. Every model airplane plan, even your almost ready to fly um, instructions, will have a center of gravity location. It's figured out for you on the almost ready to fly. As you build an airplane, you have to think about the center of gravity as you're building the aircraft to make absolutely certain that the airplane balances at that center of gravity. In the case of the Pronto here that I built from plans, part of the build was converting this from a gas-powered motor to an electric-powered motor. The gas motors were very heavy. 
So I was concerned that if I didn't have that weight of the motor in the front as I was building this, it would tend to come out tail heavy. So what I did was I actually made the nose, extended it about two inches to have the electric motor further forward to help with the center of gravity. The center of gravity is typically about 25% back from the leading edge, in this case, right by the top spar. Most aircraft will have a range of center of gravity. It could be a forward center of gravity or an aft center of gravity. The more forward the center of gravity, the more stable the aircraft is. The more aft the center of gravity, it is less stable, but the wing uh, is more efficient. So for high performance reasons, say an airliner, they might actually shift the center of gravity a little bit further aft with passage of the fuel to let it fly a little bit longer. For sport flying RC aircraft, it's a real good idea just to keep it about 25% back and that'll uh, be okay. And just kind of, kind of an example from lessons learned, when I first did, b d converted this to electric flight, I had this for the battery hatch. I figured the battery should be right about here. When I actually built it, I realized the battery had to be further back here, thus the need for another hatch to have the battery be located back here. Again, the center of gravity is actually absolutely crucial for anything that you, um, any aircraft that you build and fly. Another just discussion point, learning point of center of gravity is when I convert these Guilo's models to radar control flight, weight is critical. My target weight is under three ounces for all these models. But what happens is as you build them, you just tend to add structure, covering, glue to the back of the airplane. It can very easily come in tail heavy. I cannot easily extend the nose. What you may have to do for any model is add weight to the front. If you look just inside here, you can see a, a, a bolt or nut rather that I had to glue in place to make sure that th this thing balanced out at the center of gravity. To give you an idea of the absolute critical importance of center of gravity was the incredibly tragic situation back in 2012 where a 747 flying out of Afghanistan with some very heavy military equipment literally went straight into the ground due to a center of gravity issue. What had happened was it was a freighter, 747. It had some very heavy military trucks in the fuselage. It was a normal mission. Everything balanced out well for the takeoff. Everything was correct. However, on climb out, somehow one of the vehicles got loose from its tie downs. It rolled to the back of the airplane, crashed through the pressure bulkhead of the aft. It did jam some control um, cables, but more importantly, the weight of that very heavy vehicle was so far aft, it just caused the airplane to pitch out, stall, and it literally went straight into the ground. The pictures that you're seeing of that crash are taken by the dash camera of a vehicle that was in the area. It happened in the blink of an eye with a complete change of center of gravity in flight. To give you some idea of the importance of center of gravity, this happens fairly often with cargo aircraft. You put the cargo after the center of gravity and it doesn't balance out, the aircraft can literally fall back onto its tail while on the ground. Oftentimes you see a little post at the back of the airplane to prevent this from happening. Another important thing for aerodynamics are having straight and true control surfaces and wings on your model. In other words, do not have a warp. A warp is something that's twisted a little bit on the wing or tail surface. We want to have the wings and tail surfaces as flat as we can. Warps will cause uh, unusual behaviors in the aircraft. If there's enough of a warp, it could cause an airplane just not to fly. What you could do for a warp is you can just look at it with your um, eyes to make sure it's flat. If the wing is without struts, you can rest it on a very flat and true surface. It is super important to make sure there's no warps before you go out to fly. The warps will have a greater effect with smaller models than larger models, but they still should be taken out. One technique for removing a warp with um, heat shrink covering is, let's say the um, outside tip was down a little bit, we can twist it the other way, apply heat to the top to shrink that covering. Very often that can take out uh, the warp to a control surface. But do your best to make sure that all your control surfaces are uh, warp free or as warp free as possible. And also keep in mind that even though we strive to make our models as perfect as possible, there can be some um, warps or misalignments or things that are not quite right.
For slower flying sport aircraft, this is usually okay. We can get away with it. I'm always reminded of the very special case in the Israeli Air Force where there was a mid-air for an Israeli F-15. It actually lost half of its wing and it managed to recover at a very high rate of speed, but it managed to land with missing half the wing. Now, we don't want to do that as a matter of course, but that's a good lead-in to another thing of aerodynamics that's not covered too much, and that is a controllability check. If something has happened to your model, maybe you had a mid-air, something's not quite right, and before you come in for a landing where you're flying kind of slow and you um, don't have as much control authority as going full speed, it's worthwhile considering doing a controllability check. Back in my days flying the F-4 um, in the Air Force, a lot of things could go wrong with that aircraft. And if there was any concern over the ability to land the aircraft at a safe altitude, would do a controllability check. We would just configure to land and progressively slow down to what we thought was the right landing speed to make sure the airplane handled well. If there was anything wrong, a wing drop off, anything unusual, that was our base airspeed. We'd just have to land at that higher airspeed, much like what that Israeli F-15 pilot had to do. So keep the idea of a controllability check anytime you're unsure of how your model is behaving after a day at the field. Dihedral provides stability in the roll axis. And so what dihedral is, if you have a flat wing and it goes up like this, this is positive dihedral. As a general rule of thumb for any sport flying aircraft, dihedral is a good thing to have. You can have a small amount of dihedral, you can have a lot of dihedral. The more dihedral you have, it's going to be much more stable in the roll axis. You might not even be able to roll it, but for a trainer aircraft, something of that nature, it might be something you want. You are not required to have dihedral. Notice with my square flyer, there's absolutely no dihedral. Again, it's a little bit touchy in the roll axis, but that's just the way this airplane is built. Other airplanes that have a large amount of dihedral is uh, the Mini B. Even though the inner section of the wing is totally flat, with the polyhedral on the out, the amount of um, angle for the polyhedral, if you cut it in half and imagine it coming from the center, that's how much dihedral this airplane has. Dihedral is very important for an airplane like this because it's a fun flyer, but more importantly, there are no ailerons with the airplane. So all the roll stability has to come from the dihedral because we turn with the rudder. That's why for things like three tra channel models, we'll have a little bit of extra dihedral. Trainers will have a lot of dihedral. Aerobatic models will have practically none. It's just a variation of the theme, high or low wing. Dihedral adds to roll stability. And just to show you how an understanding of a dihedral can help you, this is my model of the Pronto. This was designed by Dave Roblin in 1972, 50 years ago. This was being filmed in uh, 2022. And this was originally a three-channel model. There were no ailerons um, on the wing. It had rudder, elevator, and throttle. So it turned by the rudder, but because it had no ailerons, the plans that I built from had about three inches of dihedral on each side. It was necessary to keep it from, uh, to be stable and roll. As I decided to put ailerons on this version, I could put much, much less dihedral in there, about one inch. Again, a understanding of dihedral can help you if you're modifying an older design. Flutter is a very um, unusual situation, but I've seen it happen a lot with model airplanes. Flutter is where the control surface vibrates. Um, it can be a self-induced vibration, and even professional aircraft designers, they know best practices to avoid flutter. They implement those. They do wind tunnel tests. Very often, the only time flutter comes up is during actual flight tests of the full-scale aircraft. If you're flying a model airplane, you hear this buzzing sound. It is flutter with one of your control surfaces. It can happen very quickly. It'll always happen when you're going a little bit faster. And it's a very serious issue because with the model airplanes, that flutter can very quickly damage your servo. You may lose control of your aircraft. If you hear flutter when you're flying your RC modeler, uh, the first thing is to throttle back and just slow down, do a quick controllability check and bring it into land to check for damage to either the control surface or the servo. The best practices used to avoid flutter are to have a counterweight for the control surface. You make the control surface as light as you can. You make sure that there are tight control linkages. There's no slop with the linkage, but it can be a pretty difficult thing to troubleshoot and get rid of on the flutter. 
But the key thing is if it happens, slow down, land, use the best practices, and um, just avoid ever getting into a flutter situation. I'd like to talk a little bit now about trimming a model airplane for flight. I have a very detailed vid uh, video on trim. Again, it's in the description how to do it. But basically, when we trim an airplane, we adjust the control surfaces so the airplane can fly hands off at that airspeed. You trim for an airspeed, so an airplane, full scale and model, let's say is trimmed at 80 knots. If you go to 100 knots, you'll have to retrim it. If you slow down to 60 knots, you'll have to trim it again. In full scale aircraft, typically you have a trim wheel for elevator. You spend most of your time trimming the um, elevator. Larger aircraft will have rudder and aileron trim. On our transmitters, we do have a trim function for each of the control surfaces here. And so these are very handy because the model may not be built exactly true or correct. We can do small changes of control surface to keep it flying uh, straight and true as we have to do it. Remember, as I mentioned before, we trim for an airspeed. We typically trim for our normal cruising flight so we can fly relatively hands off at normal cruising flight. Keep in mind, if you go faster or you slow down for landing, you'll have to put in some control input to keep it flying where you want. So it'll be temporarily out of trim for that period of time. I'd like to talk now a little bit on the advantages and disadvantages of having a high or low wing airplane. There are lots of inputs to how an airplane flies with a high wing or low wing. In full scale aircraft, say a Cessna versus a Cherokee, things like being able to see the ground, seeing other um, uh, traffic in the uh, landing pattern, uh, ground effect, all come into play with a high wing or low wing. For models, as a general rule of thumb, a high wing model will be more stable than a low wing model due to what they call a pendulum effect. The center of gravity is just below the center of lift on the wing. That's why most of the trainers you see, for sure, all the early RC models were high wing aircraft. They were just inherently more stable because the weight of the model was below the wing. It just contributed to stability because in the very early days of RC flying, the models were essentially free flight designs that were guided by radar control, many times rudder only. Same way for uh, trainers, we just want them to be as stable as possible. But that depends. If you have a low wing model with a lot of dihedral, that can be fairly stable. But generally, high wing models will be more stable. And as an aside, one of the very early aerobatic RC models was the Astrohog back in the early 1960s with reed control. It was a low wing model. There were a lot of people back then that weren't quite sure you could fly an RC model aircraft with a low wing. It had a fair amount of dihedral, ailerons that flew well, but high wings would be more stable. One other thing of aerodynamics that I'd like to point out, just as a kind of tip, is the concept of elevons. So elevon is a combination of the word elevator and ailerons. In other words, it's the same control surface that provides elevator for pitch control and ailerons for roll control. Elevons are required for things like flying wings and for kind of unique models like this foam board F-22 that I uh, built. And what will happen is this model has throttle control, but there's no ailerons or rudder here, rather just these tail surfaces back here, which are elevons. You program it through your computer radio, but let me demonstrate the elevons. This is up, down, just like regular elevators, but through the magic of the computer radio, they can also go like this to provide a very effective roll function. So this is the aileron function, elevator function, and we can use that to very precisely control the airplane through the elevons. It's a, it's a nice trick to have for the appropriate model that may need the elevons. Another thing in this day and age that's being filled in 2022 <clears throat> that is tied in very close with aerodynamics is technology. Uh, technology is, is just a part of flying these days and it can really help us with flying. This is an E-Flight Pitts, all right? This is a small model. If you were just to build this back 20 years ago without any assistance from electronics to fly this thing, it would be a challenge. It's a full four channel model. You see the elevator, the rudder, and the ailerons, as well as the throttle. What happens is, as I added throttle, you can hear that chirping that's going on. And what's happening is the controls are moving ever so slightly as the model moves. 
This is built-in AS3X, or Automatic Stabilization 3 axes that is part of the receiver. What happens with AX3X? So you heard the chatter uh, from that AS3X. What happens is, as the model flies through bumps in the air, or any amount of turbulence, the AS3X automatically smooths it out to make it a very predictable, realistic flying model. So that is a case of technology very seamlessly blending in with aerodynamics to provide a good flying model. It's not anything we can do in our home shops too much, but it does allow models that previously would be very difficult to model, like this small little um, biplane, which, by the way, with no dihedral to speak of whatsoever, from flying well due to technology. Thank you for tuning into this video. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of aerodynamic, aerodynamic um, situations that you need to understand to fly a model airplane. We get away with a lot with our model airplanes, and you We've all seen some unusual designs out of the field or in the magazines or in, our, or in the uh, various videos. We can do that because they're small, they're lightweight, they um, uh, have plenty of power. It'd be very hard and just not worthwhile to build anything like this for full scale. But by keeping in mind some of the principles of aerodynamics, especially things like the center gravity, you can someday anticipate and avoid a crash with your model airplane. So thank you for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you in future videos.